Welcome to the Author Road Again podcast. I'm Chris. I'm Ross. And I'm Scott. Uh, and this is our podcast about anything and everything off road. We're going to kind of go all over the place tonight, and I'm totally here for it. I should be here for it. I set the Zoom meeting reminder for everybody. Anyway, uh, we're still socially distanced. It's the only way we can do the show. We did it every, way before it was ever mandated. I'm still in the Midwest, and Ross and Scott are both in the Northeast. Like, it's almost like we were in person in life. Almost. Yeah. <laughs> Two thirds of us are expecting snow right now. True. Ah, suckers. I did that last night. Yeah. yeah I did. <laughs> <laughs> And I, they, they were like one to two. It's a dusting. I literally cleared my driveway with a leaf blower. Nice. Oh, that is brilliant. Actually. Which as a person with a north facing driveway, I was stoked. <laughs> that is. Yeah. Write that one I'm down. Give me a leaf blower. And if you don't have battery powered ones are even better, Ross, because then you don't have to like worry about fuel and stuff. It's like just. Yeah. I will say like the batteries don't last as long in the cold though. So two batteries, so, but anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, the industry news is we're going to talk about we're going to talk about Chevy Silverado, but not the Silverado people are probably going to think we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the ZR2. Yes, I didn't. I didn't it read is, the article. You got to help me. It's okay. It's actually from a couple of weeks ago, but we've been talking about the ZR2 and how it's kind of like a between Raptor and Trail Boss ordeal. And there's a rumor, a report. GM Authority said that it's going to be priced around sixty five to start to get in the door which 65 is Raptor price. I was to say, that's very close to the Raptor, right? It is Raptor price. And it's quite a bit less than the, the TRX, but 65 is still a pretty big number. And yes, it has the Multimatics, you know, the spool valve shocks. And yes, it has 33s. And yes, it's the biggest and baddest Chevy yet. But that 65 is just getting the door. And, and the way pickup prices are these days, you know that there's another go higher, 15 to twenty thousand dollars worth of options left on the table so i, I saw something on twitter official and you can you can stop me if i've already if we've talked about this on the show that the average car payment now in the u.s is in the mid 600s average car payment like car, payment. car payment yes 636 dollars is what the for staff a single vehicle or for a for single household? vehicle no one vehicle 636 and i was like i know where my mortgage is at and I know where my car payment is at. I can't imagine Same. having my car payment be like, I, I do a lot of jobs. I have extra jobs, but like, I'd have to go get more. Like, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> but that's also probably, I wonder, I wonder, I'd like to see the breakdown of, you know, where it falls into like lease versus purchase versus how much money down, what percentage, right? how many, you know, is that people just doing like big payments on a four-year note or is this like, 636 for you know eight years <laughs> yeah i'm not sure financially bankrupting themselves but that's their problem anyways let's talk about something more awesome than the easier two. the the i don't is it tjm that's the yes, company right that is the company they are one of our friends from australia um one of the, the bigger off-roading names and they got their hands on an lc300 uh one of the I, I don't know if it was a pre-production or if they just like grabbed one of the first ones off the lot and threw all their stuff on it. But the tailor made parts are, are here for the 300 series. And it, it is kind of a showcase of everything that they probably plan to put out at first. And it, it looks like the quintessential Australian four by four build, you know, big bull bar snorkel. I'm um, sharing. I'm sharing. I promise. It's, it's a killer looking thing. Of course, I forgot um, to give Scott the heads up that I share my screen so we can know what we're talking about. Yeah, so, that's fine. So when we post the video, you know, I don't have to yeah. edit. <laughs> so what, the thing that's really interesting for me, at least, is that the turnaround time, you know, some manufacturers here at least get their hands on vehicles in advance because yep. of SEMA. Yep. You know, like they'll, well, they don't, they'll get they don't really get their hands on. They just show up with tape measures and start measuring yeah, or, or 3D scanning equipment yeah. or, you know, some kind of like uh, a dollar car goes to them so they can play with it for a bit and then it gets crushed. But, you know, the ability to scan things and then just throw it into like SolidWorks and pump out something in the real world, like this is quick. This is very, very fast turnaround for you know, something they presumably have only had for a couple of weeks or a month. Um, and it, it looks like it was in development for years. 
It, so to be honest, doesn't it look like a lot of the same stuff? It just happens to be on a different truck now. It sure does. And it very well might be. I don't, I don't know how much adapting needed to be done. This shit. I don't know. It could be the same bumper just with different mounts. <laughs> <laughs> but I kinda, it's a cool looking thing. I, I do like the 300 series trucks. I know, I know we're not getting them. We're getting the, yeah. the Lexus LX with its standard trim to be the Land Cruiser replacement, mm-hmm. but like I don't know. They don't do it for me anymore. Is that it's like sacrilege? Uh I don't know. I I don't know. I don't know. I'm into it. I like the 300. I'd happily play with the 300. But I mean, I'd go drive one. Like I'm I'm sure it's awesome. But like seeing more pictures of them now, the the back window, the third window between the A, B, C, and D pillars is the same shape as the Prado and 460. Yeah, it's a rear quarter. Yeah. They had extra glass, Russ. They just put it where they needed to. <laughs> <Probably>. <laughs> so that's the TJM build. Uh, good looking thing. Recommend taking a look. And then our final piece of news is this unbelievably odd trailer that I happened upon thanks to friend of show Matt from Expedition Portal. And I don't know. Scott's face was so good. I yeah. should have left. I, oh, I wish I could have wow. zoomed. <laughs> that was the same face I made when I saw it this morning. I was drinking coffee and I, I like literally stopped. I was like, what is that? It so, looks like it came out of a video game. For, for the audio listener, or for the listener, all, all listeners should be audio, right? Um, yeah, it, that's how it works. It's, it's called the Whale Travel Trailer. And it literally looks like someone made an anthropomorphized trailer out of a whale Mm -hmm. and it's just like doors hatches doors tops pop things slide out Mm -hmm. it looks like a fish it really does look like a fish it's legitimately yeah it looks like a fish it's got gills in places it does the wheels have like a like an aquatic aesthetic to them yeah like it's it's an extremely extremely strange thing it's so and nice. I I can't help but think, Chris, if you scroll down in that picture, there's even there's more. Is there more? Yeah, oh yeah. That make oh. it that that don't really help explain anything else. No, but, like it if it's all closed up, it looks like a if you, you would like. So when I lived in Florida and taught middle school science, I was like, oh, it's a manta ray. Like if it's yeah. like they built a ray out of a trailer. Yeah, it, it, color it, scheme, like all of it, they, they stayed with the nautical. Yeah. Um. <laughs> You know what it makes me think of? Hold on. Please hold. I'm thinking of Please something. Please holding. Please hold. Uh, is it is it in Attack of the Clones where they're underwater? Yeah. Uh, it looks like it would be that. One of those things that Jar Jar rides in? Yes. We're, well, the three of them ride in. So I there's, think that's actually... Always a bigger, the, there's always a bigger fish scene. I think it's the Phantom Menace. Is it Phantom Menace? We've gotten very specific for Star Wars references, and I'm not good at Star Wars references. <laughs> I thought it was. Uh, I'm going to take your word for it. I'm not going to refuse. We're going to find out. We can move on, but I, I do recommend looking at this trailer, I, and then having nightmares about it tonight. Well, it, it's not. It's not awful as trailers go. Like, think about the um, the Mantis. Remember that one? Like, it was kind of. This is just kind of like a curvier version, like. Similar idea. Mm-hmm. Oh, fuck. You're right. It is Phantom Menace. <laughs> <laughs> don't break Star Wars references at me. I don't know them. So I, I thought I did. I was trying to see if there were any specs on it. Um, like how many it sleeps. How many pixels it is. It, the, it's fake. It's not real. It's, it, it's, it's definitely, a rendering and it's definitely not real. But hold on. The, when you go to the flip side. So we, we the picture I for the audio listener, I showed down the right side and it, it just looked like a hatch that opens to get in. But if you go to the opposite side, it looks like the kitchen slides out, mm-hmm. creating more interior space. The bed slides back out of the back of it. So there's and, living space in, in the front that goes into the pop top. And I, what I'm wondering is if this pop top is set up the way like a, um, a sports mobile pop top is how the, the roof of the truck extends up and then that what goes with that is a platform bed that you can then pull down and mm-hmm. then you have another kind of sleep space. So I bet this thing, I want to say it sleeps four with the Probably possibility four. of like a fifth 
with a like if there's a, a small version of a dinette in there. I I can't help but think this thing would be seventy five grand if it was real. Oh, it's it's up there for sure because it looks like it's just one molded piece of fiberglass or of rendering. <laughs> <laughs> What's the the mantra that I've been on lately is stop quoting renderings for concepts that don't exist for electric vehicles. So like let's not let's not quote prices right. for something that we haven't seen in person yet. Fair enough. Fair enough. So yeah, that's that the news. Um. That's the fun news. My own personal stuff is pretty quick. All the parts and tools have arrived to finish up the two things that I started building about three weeks ago for the Lexus. So tools. tools yep. A couple, a uh, couple drill bits might've gotten okay. lost in the move. So had to <laughs> replace them and uh, Amazon primes, two day shipping turned into 10 day shipping. So now uh, I have a, uh, that's kind of normal lately. Yeah. Fresh new set of Milwaukee drill bits sitting here ready to go for Saturday when I have some free time. So you have on here that your uh your quick deflator lost oh, the lever. So yeah, you're looking for my quick deflator. I was going through stuff in my garage just trying to get ready for my upcoming <laughs> trip in March. This is my quick deflator. Uh it's super cheap. I bought it at Walmart probably six years ago for I think under 20 bucks. And uh and it, it's its lever has disappeared. I don't oh, know. No how or where but it's uh yeah the actual lever the release has uh, vanished so, so i know i know that you mentioned a company in the show notes i'm not gonna say them yet because i'm trying to quickly uh get to one <laughs> uh friend of the show adventure imports remember mm-hmm. adam i do remember adam they have what's it called it's called in deflate okay um and they have a two hose or a four hose unit okay which i think would be super fancy for you too so we might we might need to send some emails we can send Uh, some emails in all fairness that is it's a lot more aggressive than what you're looking for. A lot more aggressive <laughs> and also about four times the price of the unit that I've been looking at to replace we'll, this We'll one. send some emails. So, we so can... we'll send some emails. But uh, yeah, this this deflator has done its job, has uh, been dropped in the mud and used on about five different rigs. So it's uh, I think it's time to give it a Viking funeral. I think you need the four hose version. Let's do all of your tires oh, at once. God. <laughs> you know, I kind of find peace in, in airing down, just sitting there and like, getting it right yeah just i'm oh, sorry for I, the audio listener i apologize <laughs> it's i think it's something for my childhood like being a kid and, and just remembering like my dad airing tires down and being yeah. like what in the hell is he doing and my thing with and airing down tires is always i always put the the valve cover on top of the tire on top of the tire and i always forget to put the valve cover back on mm. the valve stem I'm too OCD to forget <laughs> carry uh, extras and everything. <laughs> I literally found some in the garage the other day and was like, oh yeah, I forgot to do that after I mm-hmm. put air in the tires. Mm-hmm. So I don't have any updates because skid plates don't exist for a Suburban. At all? <laughs> Dude, I have, the amount of times I have searched 2017 Chevy Suburban skid plates. Okay. But the Z71 did come with a front skid. It Correct. does, but remember, you, you have to get that front skid. You then have to use the Z71 front bumper cover, which is five hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. Okay, Un- unpainted. Um, why does it have to be painted? Because then I have a black most of my front end that doesn't match my white truck. So, rattle can it? <laughs> You're being, stop being very practical here. I'm not. I'm, I don't know. I. <laughs> I look at front bumpers in, in the manner of they're going to get beat up. So that's true. Um, yeah, I need, I need to talk about that some more. So, um, anyway, let's get to the good part. <laughs> let's get to the good part. As Instagram says, or TikTok says, let's get to the good part. Um, Scott is joining us. Scott runs a website and a podcast. Called yeah, I mean, Far- it's, pri- it's primarily a podcast, but I have a website <laughs> for the podcast. Yes. And I'm on social media, obviously. Yeah. We right. do too. It's yeah. great. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we have Hoonover. So we have, we have weirdly two websites. So, um, but your, your podcast is called Far From Home. It's a, a travel podcast. I should probably let you give the pitch as opposed to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
sure. Uh, it's uh, so I'm I'm a longtime journalist. I worked in public radio for many years. I've done print and audio reporting, um, and I started decided to start this show a few years ago. It's called Far From Home, and I report fascinating stories from my travels to far flung parts of the world, uh, including many places that the average visitor or tourist would not go to um, places like Iran and Mongolia and Chernobyl and Turkmenistan. Um, yes. And uh, a lot of them, uh, well, I mean, the one big kind of driving trip, and a lot of my, my travels aren't driving, but uh, the one big driving trip I took was the whole first season of my podcast, where I uh, documented this uh, 11, actually ended up being an 18,000 mile uh, road trip I took oh. from the UK to Mongolia and back that what you're seeing on the screen that's actually the, the first going there from the UK to Mongolia and then I actually decided to drive all the way back um, not the same way across Russia across Siberia um, but uh, so, it was through 21 countries uh, yeah. holy okay how'd you <laughs> go ahead Chris go ahead <laughs> no, just, you started talking so the, go the ahead. amount of like A B C D E F G H I A B C D E F G H I like you have multiple days with multiple points, it looks like, for for just how many weeks did this take? Uh, going there uh, took, I think, 52 days, about seven weeks. Um, and then on the way back, it was much more direct. And, you know, the roads are better in Russia. So that took, I, I don't know, maybe three weeks, something like that. OK. Um, it obviously wasn't a direct route, but that the point was it wasn't a race. It wasn't, you know, the point wasn't to get there as quick as possible. It was kind of the whole journey along the way. It was part of this event people may have heard of called the Mongol Rally. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, they, I mean, they just, I don't know how much your listeners and viewers might know about the Mongol Rally, but there's only a few rules of the event. Uh, one of them is that you're pretty much on your own. It's very kind of loosely organized. Okay. Um, so they basically have like a, you know, the launch party, they have maybe like a midway thing and then they meet you at the finish line, but you're pretty much on your own during the whole route. So you've got to work out all the logistics yourself. If you get stuck in the middle of nowhere, you can't call them and have them help you. You got to figure it out on your own. Um, and they make you take kind of a ridiculously small car. They actually limit the size of your engine to uh, one liter, or if they're being generous, they'll go up to 1.2 liters, but oh a, a, a little tiny car. So uh, you know, for comparison, I, and I didn't know, I mean, you just went through this whole top of your show talking about cars, like I didn't know anything. And I kind of still don't know a lot about vehicles. Um, I, you think I would, would have learned something through our trip. I learned a little bit, but um, a lot of this is kind of Greek to me. But for comparison, like my Toyota Prius is 1.8 liters. So, you know, That's our car, we ended up driving this Nissan Micra, uh, which is, oh was 998 cc. It's like less than a liter. Mm -hmm. um, little tiny hatchback that someone described to us as something like a, a middle-aged woman would drive to get her groceries in central London. Like it's not something you drive <laughs> to Mongolia. Right. Um, and so it's a little tiny hatchback did not have a lot of horsepower for going up steep hills, which became a problem. And, you know, a lot of this mountainous territory that we were going through. Um, oh, and that's not you. <laughs> no, that's not us. That's okay. You actually may want to pull up my Instagram uh, okay. if you want. It's just Instagram.com slash far from home podcast. Uh, if you scroll way down, way down, see uh, pictures of the whole journey. Um, but uh, yeah, this little car also just, it didn't have an air conditioner because he's in, in the UK, you know, it doesn't get that hot that mm -hmm. often. So, you know, here we are driving this little tiny hatchback without AC through like the desert in Turkmenistan and Iran and these places where it was extremely hot. So we just had the windows wide open and these cooling towels, that, you know, doing the best we could to, to stay cool. But we had a lot of trouble, a lot of car trouble. Um, and, and we went, so it was my brother and myself in one vehicle. And then we were with our friends, Rosie and Jane in another vehicle. They also had a Nissan Micra. Their car, they were, had hardly any problems at all with their vehicle. We just got very unlucky. Luck of the draw. Uh, we we yep. bought it used from this, this um, Pakistani guy in, in London. And we, I don't know, we took it, we had it checked out by a mechanic and they found a few issues, but we thought it was okay. And I mean, it was just difficult buying a car from afar. You know, we're across the ocean in the US. We had to like work out the logistics ahead of time. So we had some British friends who like went and tried to like go car shopping for us, look online, look for used cars. <laughs> and so we're doing this from afar. You know, ideally if it were me, I would never buy a car until it gets fully looked over by the mechanic. 
but they just kind of had to do a visual inspection. And then because the mechanic was like in another part of the UK. So they, you know, took it to him after they had already purchased it. And then he kind of found some issues. He found some like rust on the door sills and some, you know, any, any rust is probably a bad sign. And we should have known that right Generally. off the bat. Um, yeah. So, you know, even though he kind of welded some things and fixed it, um, oh boy. it was still, you know, we there were problems from the very beginning. And that I think was a, not a good sign. Um, so, you know, it started out with kind of minor things. We were having some radiator issues or what we thought were radiator issues. We were as early as like Germany when we first started having problems and it got progressively worse. And we ended up through the rest of our route visiting a mechanic in every single country with the exception of Kurdistan. Oh um, and it's not the kind of goal or achievement you want to say by the end of it yeah well the, the funny thing is the whole point of of the rule you know that the organizers put in place that you have to take this like ridiculously tiny car is that they want you to bring something that's not really suitable for a journey of this sort mm -hmm. because it'll force you to inevitably you'll break down you'll be forced to interact with the locals so you're not just like zooming through these countries like you'll have more adventures right you actually um, experience the culture and the people instead of just like yeah like on a bull run where you fly through and yeah exactly exactly and so it's all well and good in theory like it makes sense um so if you break down two three times okay you have more of an adventure but but in our case like by the seventh eighth ninth time like it gets old real fast <laughs> and it became kind of like a money pit and like mm. we're wasting all this time at yet another mechanic where we'd rather be out like having adventures seeing cool things you know yep. so it was really annoying uh, and we just kind of got unlucky so yeah we started having like radiator issues we would overheat we would have um I mean, all kinds of problems and it got progressively worse, culminating with, I mean, we overheated in the middle of the desert in Iran. Was that a head gasket yeah, I saw? Yeah, well, that's what I'm leading out. up to. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, in Turkmenistan, we ended up finally blowing our head gasket and we took it to a mechanic and he tried to repair it. And, you know, obviously he needs more time. He needs the parts um Turkmenistan is like the second most authoritarian country in the world they're refusing it, really? we just had a five-day transit visa um yeah after North Korea it's like the second most authoritarian country in the world so it's hard to even get a visa mm -hmm. they refused to extend it so we needed more time to get our car repaired so we had to stick it on the back of a flatbed tow truck get it towed six hours to the border of Uzbekistan and then wait a week for a new head gasket to get shipped from Dubai oh. um so like yeah so How? then they basically they rebuilt our whole engine you know they had to in Uzbekistan it, it took like you know a bunch of days um it's funny because here we are you know everyone said we didn't know much about cars we were doing our car shopping and everyone says get a Japanese car you know it'll be great it, you could find parts mm -hmm. anywhere we get to Uzbekistan what is everyone driving Chevrolets they, <laughs> <laughs> they have like apparently there's a Chevy plant in Uzbekistan believe it or not that's where and Chevy's so, gonna die <laughs> I, and so if we had had a Chevy like they easily could have gotten the part oh, for us funny. it would have been no problem like who would who would have guessed um and we you know we didn't know what to do we had no idea what we were getting into with this whole trip so we we went you know to you know halfords which is like the car parts store in the uk and we we uh went you know shopping we got some extra belts we even got an extra clutch because we my brother and i we had never driven stick before and so we thought we'd burn out the what? clutch. We, there was so many there was such a learning curve we had, also it's a british car so the steering wheels on the right yeah and then once you cross over to continental europe Man. and you're driving on the other you know you jumped into the deep end you didn't it was, like, take it easy yeah, it was yeah it was like a complication of so many things so we yeah so we brought an extra clutch we brought these extra belts all these things but you can't bring every conceivable part oh, no. of something that could break and the head gasket is not so, not something we ever would have imagined to bring you well, know especially in so a, just a micro doesn't have a lot of cargo yeah. space like no oh yeah no it's a tiny little car and it was packed to the right. hills we had a roof rack we had everything just um, stolen it off the other micro not saying anything. yeah right right uh, so, we, i think we did consider that um, but uh yeah i don't know what happened I, I, your engine was together when i went to bed yeah so they they rebuilt our whole engine uh in uzbekistan but you know i've, I've heard that even in the best case scenario like it's 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 not it's more of an art than a science like it, it's things can go wrong yeah. and it's it's really hard to rebuild a whole engine 
and we think they really weren't very good mechanics in retrospect anyway. Um, <laughs> and so even after they rebuilt the whole engine, oh. we continued having issues throughout the rest of oh, the trip. That's a bomb. Like they're, they're used to Chevys and then all of a sudden I, they have this, so. this yeah. Nissan four ring. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So we, we continued having trouble throughout the way, not as bad, but there were a number of instances where we didn't, you know, we seriously thought, okay, we're just going to have to cancel the trip and go home. Like when we were in the mountains in Tajikistan, it was three miles high and, you know, there's less, the air is thinner there, the engine yeah. needs more air, but we had this issue where there was somehow leaking oil onto the air filter, the air intake filter, which is not a good thing. No. Um, so, yeah, so. <laughs> oil and the intake. No, so on. we, yeah, we, the car just would not make it anymore and then we we couldn't you know we got stranded in the absolute middle of nowhere on the Pamir highway in Tajikistan and we we finally found some kids who came along we were able to you know attach a tow rope and they they towed us the rest of the way mm. um but yeah and then the car just we brought it to a mechanic and then it just miraculously restarted <laughs> like, uh, like <laughs> we like we have had no just had it at that time we, we have no idea what the hell is going on and then in Kazakhstan we uh, ended up um, breaking down in the field of, a, of wild marijuana, which it just like grows along the, the roadsides in Kazakhstan. Really? Um, yeah, That's yeah. It just wild. Like, it's, it's a weed. It just like literally weed. It just like <laughs> grows everywhere wild in Kazakhstan. And we like pulled over to take fun. some pictures and then our car wouldn't start again. Um, That's yeah, funny. I, I know what clip I'm promoting the show with. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we, uh, we, uh, we towed it, our, our friends, Rosie and Jane, attached the tow rope yet again, towed us into town in this little village in Kazakhstan. We go to the mechanic there or like a gas station. We're looking for a mechanic trying to commute, communicate with them because, of course, we don't speak Kazakh mm -hmm. or Russian. They don't speak English. Um, and then some people, you know, it's like a Saturday morning. They're out running errands and they see us there across the street. And so they come over to us. And nicest people, the woman was an English teacher. Her name was Nadia. So she spoke good English and said, you don't want to go to this guy. You should come to our mechanic. Um, so they call their guy up on the phone and they say, hey, your friends are here. We didn't know what they were talking about. But they, so they, they say, follow us. And so we follow them like over a set of railroad tracks down the hill, you know, to another part of town. It's a Saturday. So their mechanic is closed. But he, he comes in, makes a special trip, opens up his, his, the gates, opens up the shop just for us. He shows up wearing a Mongol rally t-shirt from like oh. a, a few years before he had helped another team. So that's what they meant when they said, oh, your friends your are friend, here. Yeah. yeah. And so he was thrilled to see us. That's awesome. He, he says, don't worry, I'll take care of your car. And meanwhile, this couple who we had just met, take us back to their place. They feed us lunch. They take us out on their motorboat on the lake where they're all afternoon. We just <laughs> met these people. Like the president of Kazakhstan's mansion is on the other side of the lake. What? And we're like swimming in this lake. Uh, uh after a few hours their mechanic friend calls him and says uh, he says i fixed your car you know come back so we get we dry off we get back in their car go back he comes drives our car over to their place they invite him for dinner so we all have dinner together and he refuses to take any money for fixing the car what, what? nicest guy his name is dimitri he did this ingenious like jury rig thing where he just like took this like uh little like pvc pipe whatever and tube and he just like so now the oil wouldn't leak onto our air intake filter anymore now it was just like dripping onto the roadway and that's fine it, it, it was it was ridiculous <laughs> but it, it worked and it like helped us get the rest of the way to mongolia and so, if, if the micro hadn't broken you never would have had that experience exactly right right yeah that's funny that's so we had that's so wild. many experiences like that where we visited so many mechanics okay so many. people who who really didn't know what they were doing but they figured you should find the picture when we were in turkey of the guy doing the the pressure test he's like Ooh. blowing into the uh something in the car it's just ridiculous i showed it to my friend uh back in new jersey who has a radiator shop and he thought it was hilarious Oh, man. Um, I might have to keep this. searching because I don't I don't know that yeah, I see yeah. it. Keep going. Okay. okay. So so while Chris hunts for this, I want to back up because we we jumped like right into the meat of all of this. So sure. A, what got you into travel? And B, what got you into travel of this capacity? Because <laughs> this isn't just like I'm gonna go to a resort, you know, somewhere oh, no. kind of thing. No, this no, is no. like this is deep stuff. Yeah. So how did yeah. how did this evolve for you? Um, I mean, growing up, my brother and I were our mother kind of taught us to kind of be adventurous and, and kind of go off on our own and do our own things. So we never obviously did anything this crazy. 
Um, but we were raised to be very independent and all. She wasn't like a very protective parent. She kind of let us, you know, have free reign to go off and do things on our own. And she trusted us. Um, a few years ago, my brother and I started traveling over Christmas and New Year's. We didn't have a lot of close family left in the area. We figured we should go somewhere, do something interesting over the holidays. So that kind of became a tradition. We went one year to Thailand and Cambodia. We went to Ecuador and the Galapagos Islands. Uh, we went to different places that, uh, yeah, there you go. There's the photo. That's the guy doing the pressure test on he's, our uh, he, Christ. He's literally blowing into what looks like it's the coolant reservoir. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, Looking for bubbles. I guess so. Yes. <laughs> Um, so, so sketchy. <laughs> um, so yeah, we started traveling every year. And then one year we went to Cuba back in, uh, I want to say it was 2014 over that Christmas and New Year's. That and so, was before it was really open? No, no, that was after. That was, that after. was after. Yeah, yeah. Yes. It was yeah, the small yeah. window. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Um, and so we were, we don't usually go like on tours, but in that case we did, we figured getting around Cuba would be a little bit easier in a tour. And so we were in this tour group and we, uh, we met this, some really cool people in the group, including this woman, Rosie, who is British, but she now lives in Australia and she was there with her husband, Alan, and they're both kind of middle aged in their fifties or sixties, uh, but very adventurous. Rosie's traveled all over the world. And so, you know, her and, and all the rest of all of us kind of bonded because we had kind of a bad tour guide. Like he got drunk and abandoned our tour group one evening. What? And so all that's, of us. That's a pretty horrible tour guide. He's yeah, not doing anything. That's, yeah. Got a tour there. Yeah. So all of us in the group kind of bonded and we formed a Facebook group and we kept in touch after our tour. And so a number of months later, Rosie reached out to my brother and me and said, hey, I'm planning on taking this crazy trip with my best friend, Jane, this thing called the Mongol Rally. We're going to drive to the UK to Mongolia. I heard about it from someone else by chance. And, um, you know, I'd love to do it. And are, would you and your brother want to join us? And it didn't take long to think about it before, like we thought there's Rosie and Jane in, in the picture there, you see, uh, where we decided, yeah, I mean, we're totally on board. This will be amazing. Um, and, and I decided also, you know, it'll be a really cool thing to document as a journalist, someone with an audio mm -hmm. background, you know, to create a podcast, not just about the trip itself, but even all the preparation for the trip, like a whole episode I did about buying the car here in this picture, we when were shopping for parts, figuring out all the visas and vaccinations we had to get, the, the planning out the route, like you can't imagine all the months of planning that went into a trip like this. Um, so, it, yeah, what did you have to do in terms of how, how many, I'm sorry, how many countries did you say it was? Uh, and at round trip, it ended up being like 21 countries, it was eight, 18 countries on the way there. Yeah. So how did you even prepare for the visas and just the border crossings? There actually aren't that many visas as Americans that we need to get. Um, I mean, obviously all Europe is, we don't need visas for mm -hmm. um, at least the countries in Europe we went to. Um and then Iran was the difficult one. You know, if you're an American, a Brit or a Canadian, you need to get a letter of entry or whatever they call it. And then you have to hire like a tour company to have a tour guide take you through. You're not allowed to just go on your own. Um, so we had to yeah, get a, a tour guide in Iran. And he wasn't like a government minder. He was just a tour guide, you know. Um, and so that was the complicated thing. And, and some of the other countries as well. Yeah, we had to get these, some of the stands in Central Asia. Um, we have to get visas hmm. for Mongolia actually as Americans you don't need a visa you could just go with your passport um, so yeah some countries were a little more difficult than others um, we also just because of the complications of you know sending out our passports to get visas and we'd have to send them to an embassy a lot of times or send them to DC um, wherever and and also just because we we're going to Iran and there could be complications with having an Iranian visa in our passport we actually got second passports which people don't realize you could do if you write a letter to the U.S. State Department you just pay your fee send a letter explaining why you need it they'll send you a duplicate passport it's only good for mm -hmm. like six months or a year or whatever but it's so that's you know, that's the one that gets the Iranian stamp or Iranian yes, stamp and yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so which was a little tricky because at a certain point in your journey you've got to figure out which country strategically okay where do I switch over from one passport to the other and so mm -hmm. it is inevitably at a certain place they a certain country sees where you have an, an ex they're put, putting an exit stamp but you don't have an entry stamp and 
that kind of caused some issues in, I forget whether it was Bulgaria or Romania, they weren't very happy with us, but <laughs> it is what it is, you know. Um, so yeah, there was that that complication, but uh, yeah, no, the visas, I mean, it, you just kind of deal with it methodically, you make a spreadsheet or whatever, and, uh, you know, figure it out. And um, and if you if you don't want to do it on your own, there's companies that will help you get the visas. Like gotcha. you, could, um, you could just send you send them your itinerary, send them your passport, and they'll do it all for you if you want to pay them. But we, we did it on our own. We figured it out. So it's it's funny. That's like if you watch like the the Ewan McGregor Gregor series where he goes, I guess east or south or a long way down or a long way up. Like those are the episodes I enjoy. So watched up. I I like listening to them plan it. <laughs> yeah like the um the windows are tight or like all yes. of the logistics that are involved right. in that it's just nuts yeah and some of the visas like the countries you got to look at carefully at your windows of when do you have to you can't enter to a certain date you've got to leave by a certain date you only have like a week window or whatever it is depending on the country so yeah. that it can be a little complicated especially if you need to make any changes in your itinerary along the way uh like this was in the summer of 2016 when we set out and it was just really bad timing through no fault of our own where we ended up, you know, at the border to enter Turkey six days after an attempted coup. And so, oh. we're, we, you know, we, we did a lot of scrambling at the last minute, like, OK, is it safe to go? Is it if we go like, is it possible to go another way? Like, how would we go? Do we stick our car on a, a ferry across the Baltic Sea? But then that ferry only runs like once a week. Or do we drive through Russia? But will our visas allow it? And then if we go that way, then we've got to go through Chechnya, which we don't really want to do. So just all yeah. the complications, <laughs> of, you know, like... <laughs> trying to weigh our options, it, it was in you know, infinitely complex. Um, and, and there are good, really good websites online that help with some of this, like Caravanistan is a really great site for Central Asia um, mm -hmm. that lists like every single border crossing and the hours it's open and people are, you know, there's message boards, people post stuff. Oh, wow. So there, there's places like, there's a lot of online resources that are really good. I don't think um, I realized how big Kazakhstan is. Oh yeah, it's one of the biggest <laughs> yeah, countries huge. in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's enormous. Um, yeah. It's a whole lot of nothing. Like it's yeah, just, right. it's just step. It's I just like, you know, desert kind of, and the most boring country of all the countries that we drove through, it's just like, you're driving for hours and hours and it's just flat. And it's like st struggling to stay awake and not get bored to tears. Like, yeah, I did not enjoy driving through Kazakhstan. Sounds like driving to Denver. <laughs> <laughs> but you got beautiful mountains in the distance. Kansas in Colorado, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. but like, once you're central Kansas out there, like there's not a lot yeah. until yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah. but it's I mean, only five hours. That's not really safe on this drive for me that I'm yeah. doing in a few weeks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This, this is really opening my eyes to how little I know about this portion of the world. Oh, I didn't know anything. You know? I mean, it was a black hole in my geographic knowledge that all of central Asia, I didn't even know all the countries, the stands like, and they have weird borders that kind of snake together. And yeah, I knew nothing about this part of the world. Most people don't, you know? Um, yeah. So we don't, I, I feel very lucky that I got to see this part of the world that most Westerners never get to go to. There is almost no education about it in mm -hmm. American, you know, school systems. Right. Yeah. Which yeah, people know very little about these. Unfortunately, that, you could say problems. that about a lot of things that we should right. really be educating people on. But well, like the comedy video for like time. the last 10 years is find Iraq on a map and people couldn't do it. Like yeah. we've been there since. 2001 guys like should be able to find iraq like nope not a clue yeah i mean kazakhstan is in the news just the last few days as we're recording this because there's been yeah. some riots there anti-government like a bunch of people died and they're setting yeah. fire to the government palace or, and everything yeah, um like but but normal people in like six hours or something yeah i was just hearing that like some police officers are currently beheaded or something it's just crazy what by some <laughs> of, the, by some of like the protesters yeah it's crazy oh, oh that, but, um, that escalated quickly it did Where? yeah yeah but, um, but aside from this, like, I don't know the last time we heard, I mean, my ears peak up because I've been to these places. So if yeah. I see Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan or somewhere in the news, I'll notice it. But the average mm. person, like, they don't know anything about this part of the world. I feel um, like yeah. this is Kyrgyzstan, oh. I feel like I've seen pictures from in the last couple of years. Oh, really? Okay. Because there was a couple that was overlanding the world. And that same couple, I think they're Australian. I think they were detained in Iran. So living oh, living out of their their I, think uh, I remember who yeah I think yeah I remember who, and they were using, using a drone or something was that what it was I think or, they might have been doing a drone to like yeah. take pictures of their rig yeah. or the what were they living out of I want I want to say it's a troopy 
Uh, it's not overlay in the yellow? Americas. Is it yellow or red? Yellow or tan? Tan. Okay. Yeah. I, I think they were in Overland Journal a few times, right? Oh, probably for sure. Because it was that up. that's kind of a big deal for the community of here's here's yeah. a couple that's fairly well known and now they're being detained. Like, <laughs> so I'm pretty sure they're out. Pretty sure they're home. <laughs> Hope so. Hope they're home and safe. I'll try and remember who they were. Yeah, let's let's try to follow up on that. See if we can uh, get some uh, some connections going. So, what was your not to hone it home in on the Mongol rally trip? But what, what were your absolute highlights aside from repeated breakdowns and uh, and tight timing? Oh, there were so many. Um, in Kazakhstan, we we met this we had met this woman back in, in Iran and her family was from Kazakhstan. And she said, when you're passing through, you, you know, you could stay with us. And so we ended up staying with us and she took us to, we ended up crashing a Kazakh wedding. Like she took us to her friend's wedding and that was really interesting. And they were eating horse meat and which they do there. And they had like a drag performer like that. Um, really? there's, you, there's actually, if also on my Instagram, if you find it, there's like a video there of, of uh, from the wedding, which is kind of funny of the drag performer. But uh, yeah, it's very different than kind of our own. Culture. Didn't see that coming. Uh, yeah, no, it was not at all what we were expecting. Um, and uh, yeah, there was that in Kazakhstan. There was uh, Iran was a very fascinating place as Americans like visiting, you know, and so people were afraid of, you know, our father was saying, oh, they're going to be chanting death to America, whatever, you know, friendliest people I've ever met in all of my travels, just a sense of Persian <laughs> hospitality. They were so excited to meet us. Wow um we met this and they were very westerner in many ways like we met this high school girl who was studying shakespeare in school and her favorite tv show is desperate housewives and <laughs> they you know they wanted to practice their english with us they were so excited they didn't even know americans could visit iran and uh they you know would chat with you for five minutes and suddenly they're inviting you to come to their home come for tea come for dinner meet their family stay with wow. them wow it was just That's... incredible we, we'd be driving on the highway and everyone would be honking and waving at us uh, you seeing our rally cars, you know, mm. and uh, we went uh, one day. Yeah, here are the people we would meet. Um, they they would uh, one day we we're driving down the highway and, and these young girls, they were actually, you know, we're driving, I don't know, 50, 60 miles per hour down the highway and they were throwing fruit at us from their car to ours. <laughs> we're like catching it uh, here. You can. Yeah, you see. Um, That's so funny. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's uh, Man. it was great. It was great. I'm, um, I'm looking at pictures on Google Maps. This is absolutely gorgeous. These areas, like, yeah, oh yeah, some it, of them out in the out in the remote areas, at least, and then maybe not so much the cities, but yeah. No, and Tajikistan was the most beautiful scenery. Just the mountains there, the Pamir Highway, which is supposed to be one of the craziest roads in the world, which snakes along through the mountains. Like I said, it, we got up to three miles high at one point. How do you Lord. spell that? Pamir, P-A-M-I-R. Um, and it, it's actually snakes through a large portion right along the border of Afghanistan, um, right across the river from Afghanistan. Um, and yeah, this is in Mongolia. You can see <laughs> lots of uh, kind of river crossings and big puddles and things we have to drive through. Roads are not. The thing about Mongolia is there's, I mean, you look at a map of Mongolia, and Mongolia is a very big country, um, but you, you see like these lines from one side of the country to the other. And you assume, okay, if they're, if not highways, they're at least some kind of paved road, like going across the country. No, <laughs> not only are they not paved, like in many places, they're just like tracks through the sand and the grass. That, that sounds following. great. Yeah, it's, I tried to get in a micro. <laughs> I was just yeah. saying, it sounds great to you and I yeah. in your Lexus, Ross. But yes. like, <laughs> I do it in micro, shit. That's good. Um, th these are the main east-west roads across the country. There's basically like a northern route and a southern route. Uh, we heard the southern one might be a little bit easier, so we did that. Uh, but it was still very rough. And oh, there's I found no the Pamir oh, ones. Oh, yeah, which, okay, sure, pull it up. Uh, well, here, this is, yeah, this is kind of, that's Afghanistan right across the river there. We're on the Tajik side. Um, and just, this is what the road was like for days. I mean, some days we-, we For looked, days? Yeah, we looked some, I mean, it wasn't that, the distance wasn't so big, but, you know, they, they actually is really flat. This is one of the few sections that was paved, but many sections, it was like this, just very rough. 
Um, and we would look at our, you know, we were being mapped by, we had this like Garmin or Delorm device that was mapping us. And some days, like at the end of the day, we'd look back and we were only doing an average of like 15 or 20 miles per hour the entire day. Like that's Man. how rough the road was. Um, and you don't want to go too fast when there's consequences like that around. When there's what? Consequences. consequences. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, a giant cliff right next to you. Yeah, yep. yeah. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, it, it was a really rough road, but amazing mountains, beautiful scenery. Um, and we were, you know, a little bit nervous at first because we're like right across the border from Afghanistan and we didn't know, you know, is it, I mean, it, granted it was like class five rapids between us and them. So it felt <laughs> like someone could have come across and, and most of the Afghan side was just like sheer cliff faces in that area. There were some hmm. areas where we were like within shouting distance of the other side, we'd see like kids playing soccer or whatever. Um, but yeah, we were initially kind of nervous, uh, but we we felt totally safe on our side. Um, we would drive through some of these little villages in Tajikistan, and the little kids were used to like seeing all the rally cars drive through, and they would stand on the side of the roads and stick out their arms, like give us high fives as we drove past. <laughs> um, That's awesome. So it was it was really it was really cool. Um, I definitely I mean the Pamir Highway. If anyone ever gets a chance, it's it's God. one of like the coolest places to do like an off road like road trip in the world. Um, I so, highly recommend it. It's the kind That's of trip so cool. I need a sabbatical for. Like, I need, yeah, right? I need time. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Shit, I would need like a year to plan. <laughs> right. At least. Yeah, no, the Palmer Highway was amazing. The other cool place, the road was way smoother, but the um, Transfagarashan Highway in Romania, um, people may have seen. It's like this crazy winding road. I think it's been on like car commercials and everything. Oh, yeah. That's, um, that's the one that that's not Stelvio, but it's, yeah, it's a very, it's a well-known road. <laughs> Dozens of switchbacks. Um, yeah. It's so cool. It's just, the view is amazing. Um, so I oh, actually, yeah. you, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. There's definitely been top gear there. A hundred percent. Right. You make jokes about going to Romania and, oh no, we have to go to Romania. And then, oh, by the way, it's like, it's the most, it's one of the, the like, best. Yeah. That's one of the episodes where they also had like, the Romanian helicopter pilot was like below them on the road too. Like yep. he was doing all kinds of oh, wow. yep. that episode's yeah. insane. Yeah. 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 I actually pulled up the, uh, I have the, um, the um, Instagram posting I made kind of at the end, summing up our trip. Uh, so we traveled 11, like going there, not counting the way back. Um, we went 11,000 miles over 53 days, 18 countries. We visited 10 mechanics. We got towed seven times, two broken axles, a blown head gasket, a busted radiator, a broken drive shaft, a tire blowout, and an emergency extraction in Mongolia. Uh, and then we finally reached the finish line. So it was so quite a trip. Yes. Only one tire is kind of remarkable for that kind of mileage and those kind of roads. And the only re and the only reason we blew the tire was because we broke our rear, I guess it would be like the wishbone or something. So the tire was like bowed out. So it was rubbing against the, the oh. car. And that's why it, we had the tire blow. Here you can see it here. It looks like it was rubbing wheel. against the shock. <laughs> yeah, the shock. Yeah, something like that. Is. Yeah. So they, they, yeah, they, they, I mean, this was probably part of the rust that we initially had so i think it was compromised from the beginning so they they, they i mean that's such a bummer yeah i mean we went over some rough terrain and especially in iran i mean they have these like speed bumps in iran i mean we're used to speed bumps here they're like painted a different color there's a sign or something so you see when it's yeah. coming up we had a, a few instances in iran where i'm driving like 35 40 miles per hour after dark and then suddenly I see the speed bump like 10 feet ahead of us. And we went like flying like Dukes of Hazzard Got air. style over it. Yeah, <laughs> it was, that happened a few oh. times and that was pretty, and that could not have been good on our, our you know, axle no. and shocks and everything. Um, so I think so, it was definitely compromised from that. So in, by the time we got to Mongolia, all the rough terrain and everything, we, it eventually broke. We got it welded. And then a few days later, it broke again, just beyond the welds. Then we had to get it welded a second time. <laughs> So you mentioned being rescued. Yes. Yeah. What was the extraction? That's yeah. where I was. How do, you, how do you call that in? Okay. Uh, well, thankfully we brought these, these satellite devices, these okay. Del Delarm in reach devices where we could send a text by satellite just in that, case of emergency. That's um, the same as a Garmin in reach. Yeah. It used to be called Delarm and now I think the company's oh, Garmin. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Garmin, Garmin's been buying companies. <laughs> yeah. Right. Ah. Um, I highly recommend it. It's way cheaper than like actual a, a satellite phone where you're making calls, but the text suffices, you know, 
Um, and it could also even send like updates. We can connect it to Facebook or whatever. So it'll send like GPS coordinates where we are, people that follow us on a map, which is really cool. Um, and so, okay, so in Mongolia, as I said, like, uh, yeah, the roads are really rough. Uh, they're hardly marked at all. There's no signs in the country that we saw, like not even signs in Russian or Mongolian, just no signs, period. Just um, nothing. Yeah, and, and, and it's GPS doesn't work very well. First of all, there's not a lot of signal, but even if there is signal, like the, there's just the country is not mapped out very well. Um, and, you know, we were, we had like several paper maps. We had our, we had Google maps when we, you know, had signal, like at the beginning of the day, leaving a hotel or whatever, we would start it and, you know, would try to keep mapping us along the way, even when we were out of cell range. And then we had from the satellite device, we had the map on there. So we're comparing like five different maps and we would still get lost. Um, we would, we would see, you know, inevitably there'd be like, Amazing. there'd be a line on the map. It's funny because there's, you think, okay, there's GPS around the world. You can't get lost anywhere, you know, anymore. Go to Mongolia. You'll get lost. <laughs> um, you, mm -hmm. we would see like a line on the map. Um, but in real life, you'd see that single road split like three or four different ways, different tracks. And you're like, how the hell do I know which way to go? You know, or there'd be, you know, several different lines uh, on the map, but it would only be one line in, in real life. And so mm -hmm. we keep trying to figure out, okay, well, which way do we go if we make a right or a left, like do the roads, do the paths eventually meet up again? Like, what do we do? Um, this is, yeah, you could see where there's a bridge out here in one of the many cases in Mongolia. Um, it looks like no, there was really a bridge in the- No, no there. Did oh, you there's no one right. Yeah. Oh, there's yes. Oh, well. <laughs> yes. There used to be a bridge. Talk about Dukes of Hazard. That's where the Dukes of Hazard is. Yeah. It's like a ramp. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, these roads are just very poorly marked. And then there'd be these river crossings we have to drive across. Uh, this here is just a puddle that you see. But there were other, like, uh, and you can find videos of them where they're actual more, like, little rivers we have to drive across. And our little micro obviously can't go. We didn't have a snorkel or anything. It can't go in water very deep. Um, so... You know, we there, there was this one day where we were driving and we went across this one river crossing and we kind of we misjudged on the exit and we kind of got stuck. Um, yeah, this is what it would look like where the path choose your own adventure. It's exactly. Like, your best yeah. caption ever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, was that Goosebumps books? <laughs> um, no, they were literally called Choose Your Own Adventure. They were, right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, uh, yeah, this one day we got stuck on the exit from one of these river crossings, and then we had to wait for someone to come and tow us out. And then we were like, okay, we don't want to have to deal with that again. Um, let's, you know, figure out something else. So we, we were driving along, and we see another river crossing coming up on the map, and we're like, okay, we don't want to have to deal with that again. So we see that, like, there's another path that, like, veers off to the right, and we thought, like, we got this harebrained idea, okay, let's take that path, because it looks like it kind of goes parallel to the main path, and maybe uh -huh. it could just meet back up with the main path a little later on, and we could avoid the river crossing, kind of go around it, which is all well and good if you're on flat terrain, but it was kind of mountainous and hilly here, and again, our car has very <laughs> little horsepower and cannot make it up steep hills. Um, so we start going this other way, and you know, it's veering a little bit farther and farther off the main path, but we decided for whatever dumb reason to kind of keep going. Um, and after like the second hill, we, we went up and over. We're like, okay, we have no choice at this point. We need to keep going because there's our car is not, if we try to turn around, we just can't make it back up the way we came. So we got to keep going. Um, we, we saw some people in like a hut with like, like some animal pelts outside or whatever. And we kind of, we said the name of the town we were going to trying to communicate with hand signals and everything. And we asked them, you know, pointing the direction we're going, can we go this way to that town? And, and they seemed to say yes. Uh, then we saw this little kid who was like herding animals and, you know, he's like 10 years old and he was like single-handedly herding like hundreds of goats and sheep. And we asked him, you know, okay, can we go to this town this way? And he was very emphatic. He's like, no, you, you know, you can't, like the road is closed. Um, and we're so like, funny. That, like, he seems to know what he's talking about. And he seems to be very adamant, but like, we don't have a choice at this point. Like we can't turn back. There's nothing we could do. So we kept going and to make a long story short, we ended up both of our cars kind of trapped at the bottom of this like rocky ravine, like a canyon um in the absolute middle of nowhere because mongolia also has the lowest population density of any country in the world and so no one oh, wow. around for miles and miles we, i mean we went to the top of the hill and looked out not a, another human being in sight 
um, and absolute middle of nowhere stranded. Um, and so we ended up sending a text by, by satellite to the American embassy in U Ulaanbaatar, the capital of Mongolia on the other side of the country. Uh, they texted us back. They dispatched a team from the Mongolian National Emergency Management Agency to come rescue us. Uh, the first team spent a bunch of hours looking for us. They, that's when they came to get us finally in the middle after you know 1 a.m. or so. Uh, the first team spent hours looking for us. They couldn't locate us. So then they dispatched another team from another town to look for us. Oh my gosh. Um, they finally found us at like one in the morning, uh, towed us back to the main road. Uh, nicest guys, again, barely spoke the English, but we, I tried to give them like a hundred dollar bill. They refused to take any money or anything. Um, and they, yeah, they, they got us out. Um, and so they like left us back by the, the side of the road and we said goodbye to them. Um, and we like, okay, we're not going to keep driving at this point. It's like one in the morning. It's after dark. We don't want to drive after dark. Who knows, you know, if we hit another pothole and do something damage or something so or get lost again. So we, we doze off half an hour later, we see their orange truck coming or we thought it was their truck coming again. And we're like, why did they come back? Turns out it was the other team that had been searching for us for all these hours. Oh no! And they amazing. Hadn't able, they hadn't been able to communicate oh, with the first team because there was no cell coverage or anything. So they oh. they came upon us and they thought they were rescuing us. And they're probably thinking like, "Why the hell do you need to be rescued? You're like on the main road." Yeah, yeah that's perfect. So good. We had no way of communicating with them, and and they're like saying, "Oh, we'll take you to the next town." And we're like, "It's one in the morning, but okay, fine, sure, why not?" You know, so we're gonna have someone escort us. So we start going like 45 minutes later that's when we we broke our axle when the or wishbone uh and so then they eventually had to like leave us at the side of the road we communicated with them can you send like a tow truck to, to come get us at like daybreak mm -hmm. um and then the funny thing if you look you'll you can find this photo as well the tow trucks in that part of the world they're just like flatbed trucks they don't tilt back mm -hmm. and so in order to get the car in the truck they need to find a place where the side of the road is lower than the road so it can be level. Drive with, it on. Yeah, but there's a, there's an even better picture, I think, oh. where you could see where it's like level with the road um, in order to kind of, yeah, they, and they like put tires and things that we could drive across so it could be level to drive onto. It was just totally ridiculous. I'm um, going to have to go back to the top because I'm not seeing it down here. Oh, sorry. That's okay. funny. No, you're right. Um, yeah. But actually, when we were in Russia at the finish line, one of the, one of the other teams actually got their car towed to the finish line and the the tow trucks in russia were a little bit more advanced but they still didn't tilt so it was actually a crane on the back of the truck so they took the seat, I, seat belts out the windows i know seat belts were this strong they lifted the car up by the seat belts i didn't know the car was down. that light <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah right <laughs> It was amazing. It was super impressive. And we're all like, like cringing, like, is this really going to work? But no, the seatbelts hold, held the weight of the car. It was crazy. That's a, that's that's a paved wild. road. This yeah. is one, one of that's the a few, nice looking road. Yeah. Well, again, this is few and far between in Mongolia. Um, though I hear they're paving a lot more now. So we're afraid if we, you know, I mean, we did this in 2016. So we're saying like in five years, I don't know what it's like right now, but if you came back and did the Mongol rally, like it wouldn't be as exciting mm -hmm. going across. It, they've added like 15% more roads. Like is, is that what they've tried? I, I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. But uh, yeah, they were definitely trying to, because this is the main East West routes across the country, like for their own infrastructure, obviously it would, they would love mm -hmm. to have paved roads. I'm sure it's crazy. Like these really rough roads through the sand and grass, like, we'd see buses going across them. Like, it's crazy. Like a bus full of passengers uh, through like the sand and gravel and like off-roading conditions. Like you'd never expect to see that. See that the best off-roader is the car that you care the least about. Right. Like, if, you don't, if you don't care, you just got to put down miles. Like you don't care yep. if you scratch it. You don't care if you bang it. Like oh, that's, if it's yeah. not your bus. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was definitely our situation. We, I mean, our roof rack, like even from the very beginning when we bought the car, like we couldn't find a roof rack that would attach to it. So we just drilled right through the roof to nice. it. Um, that's the way to try do to it. caulk around it so it didn't leak you know um but yeah we didn't i mean we didn't we knew we weren't going to keep the car we were just going to junk it in the end so Dude, southern russia looks a lot like the american west yeah yeah that, that Montana? was in tuva in southern russia really fascinating place it has like its own culture and everything that's people may have heard of tuvan throat singing um so i went there and actually 
you know, learned all, of, I, we got to watch the Tuba National Orchestra and I took like a throat singing lesson and really it's uh i can't do it don't ask me it's really hard um <laughs> class out but but it was very is super fascinating place yeah yeah that looks like the dakotas kind of yeah yeah it does it yeah. looks like a... it's funny yeah. all right so where else what uh aside from the rally where else are your like worldly highlights and must sees or must go back kind um, of places i mean on the way back we stopped in chernobyl which is one of the most curious, fascinating places I've ever been anywhere. Um, super cool. Like you, you're wandering through abandoned buildings that were, it's like a time capsule, you know, people mm -hmm. on this one day in 1986, people were told like, you can, you know, you have to leave, but you'll be able to come back in a few weeks and they haven't been allowed back since. And so there's still mm -hmm. like calendars hanging on the wall of, you know, frozen in time. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, and you'll crazy. see some of the other pictures near that one of, um, of, uh, yeah, the abandoned amusement park. Yep. Uh, it's just super eerie. Um, so yeah, I should is one of the most fascinating places that I've ever, ever been to. So I, I spooky. That. yeah, super yeah. spooky. So there are places you can get to here, but you can't get everywhere. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, you, can, you can't, first of all, you can't drive there yourself. You have to go like on a tour. Oh, okay. um, and so you go like from Kiev, you, from Kiev, you could take like a day trip there. They have like, or, or you could even go overnight or somewhere. If you want to do a more extended thing, they have places you could stay overnight and you get to meet some of like the old timers, like locals who still live there, refuse to leave. Um, and you get, yeah, I mean, technically they say they're not allowed to take you in any buildings, but all the tours do, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so they, yeah, I mean, there are certain places where they, you know, you have Geiger counters and the, the, the guides know where they can and can't take you. And there are certain places where they uh, say, well, you, you can't go step off the roadway there because it's, it's really dangerous there. Um, the radiation levels are higher, but you're okay here if, or, or stay on the, stay on the pavement, don't go on the grass or something like that, you know. It's wild. So, yeah, yeah. But that's super fascinating place. Yeah. So, yeah, um, I, I can't imagine what it's like to visit there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's yeah. One of the coolest places I've ever been. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, and uh, aside from that, I don't know. I've done a lot of traveling. I've uh, spent a lot of time in Peru. I met this uh, like shaman medicine man guy, and I kind of went on this adventure with him to this, what they call like the wits, uh, witches or wizards market to look for this star shaped stone that he saw in this hallucinogenic vision that was supposed to have magical healing powers. Wow. And so that was, that was That's awesome. adventure. Yeah. And then I, I, I attended that he was leading this ayahuasca healing ceremony. Um, oh man. Where, yeah. So that was super fascinating. Um, it was almost like an exorcism or something. Um, really? Watching that. Hmm. Like, yeah. Watching the people they are almost like this one woman was almost like possessed and you know, wow um so yeah i've gone on a lot of adventures like that and i really try to capture i mean what i do with audio like because there's a lot of like travel podcasts out there but people are just like talking about the places they've been but you know coming from like the public radio background i like bring my recorder with me as i'm going on these adventures and capture it. it's like movies for your ears you know mm -hmm. so people listen they say like i feel like i was there like that's what i'm trying to do to, especially during this time of the pandemic when people can't travel to like take them on adventures oftentimes like out of their comfort zone or you know mm -hmm. to really get them to travel places sonically um so that's kind of what i try to do yeah that's awesome yeah. um didn't see chernobyl being up there on the list that that Call yeah. me by surprise, but yeah, not a, yeah, yeah. It's not a place that people think of, but it's uh, it's actually amazing that uh, there's more tourists than I I realized that go there, and I'm sure since the HBO thing came out, I'm sure there's even oh, more yeah. people now, you know. Yep. But really fascinating place. Yeah, Chernobyl's not on the list for me. <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't need I, that. I one. recommend it really. I, I <laughs> again, they. I'm sure these. <sighs> I think they said at the time we went, I think they were saying like 18,000 tourists a year visited. I'm sure it's way more now, but they, I mean, they have rules that like even the tour guides, like they can't, they need to take off a certain number of days per month or what, you know, I mean, they're monitoring how much radiation they have, like for like a day, like we went, they say it's like less radiation you get than like a transatlantic flight, you know, mm. or, or, oh, that okay. a, or that a smoker, you know, I guess smoking cigarettes have radiation. Yeah, that's not a, a good reference point. No, 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
but um, yeah, it was basically like getting, you know, an x-ray at, at the dentist or something. It was, okay. you know, the amount of radiation for the amount of time that we were there was, was pretty yeah. trivial. Uh, you know, you couldn't live there full time, but. I found the videos. <laughs> Yeah, oh, there's a few. Yeah, there's another one on the. Uh, the I just needed to go to the website. website. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. So that's the Transpagarashen Highway. In, yeah, in house. Romania. Yeah. Man, that looks like a blast. Yeah, yeah. So this gives you a good sense of all the different types of terrain that we went on. I, I oh, feel like that's so I now, cool. I now need to find some of the tiny engine, but with like off-road suspension. Lot of Neva. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My friends, Jane and Rosie. I yeah. think Lada's engines are too big, Ross. Are they? I think they're like 1.6. I'm not sure. Well, I'd be able to tell you if I could type. Well, I, I, I'm sharing my screen. So as many times as You're I have right. done lately, I can't start. 1.6. Was I right? 1.6. Even a, What about a, the one liter Fiesta with a lift kit? I mean, that. I don't know if turbos are illegal or not, so... Because <laughs> that's a three-cylinder, uh, one-liter turbo. It's EcoBoost. It is. Sure. Mm, um, I don't know. Yeah. What? Well, so what was? So, like, and I know, like, there. It's not really a race. It's more just go from. It looks like you guys were at Goodwood. Like you were on. Uh, yeah, we so, started at the racetrack in Goodwood. In yeah, the which, UK. yeah. That's kind of cool. Talk about <laughs> yeah, to drive economy. around the track. Yeah, it was neat. Oh, yeah. Man. Yeah. So going from one of the most magical automotive places ever to all the way to Mongolia. Yeah. You, you said you were broke down for like a week. Did, did your friends just stay with you and wait with you guys? Oh like, yeah. They, did, in, in Uzbekistan, yeah, they waited with, I mean, we were kind of together. We you were tied we, together the whole time. Yeah, yeah. We, we helped each other. I mean, I can't even say how many times, what did I say? Seven, seven times they towed us at the attach the tow rope. <laughs> I mean, if they weren't with us, we would have been totally screwed. Um, mm -hmm. How often did you guys see other people on the rally? Oh, quite often. Uh, okay. And that was really cool. Like people who, you know, you hadn't seen since you left in the UK or whatever. And then suddenly in the middle of Turkmenistan or somewhere where, you oh, know, that's we'd be wild. camping out at this fire pit in the middle of the desert. And then there's all these other like, you know, Westerners. Like Everybody else is like, us. yeah, we should park here too. Yeah, how many... yeah it, it was really cool. Yeah. Any idea how many started and how many finished? I did know that, and I, I don't remember off the top of my head. That's okay. Um, I, the majority of, of them finished, um, but there were some people, and some broke down, some just kind of gave up for whatever reason. Um, but you, you know, um, various different reasons. Some people just like, they ran out know, of they time. Got, they got tired of it, or <laughs> yeah, they, or they had mechanical difficulties and they only had so much time off of work or whatever. So they, you know, had to just fly home and abandon it um various different reasons but mm -hmm. uh Is, I, from what i recall the majority i'm trying to look it up now the majority of groups did finish um <laughs> from what i heard so yeah all right my my next question is going to be maybe a little too personal did you guys have any back issues like those roads yeah, were right. absolutely horrific yeah no back issues no okay <laughs> i mean we we had the seats were comfortable enough. We, uh, oh. yeah, that was one thing we didn't, thankfully, didn't have. Uh, <laughs> Stretching, just watching the videos. <laughs> All right. I'm yeah, it was a lot, a lot of sitting, a lot of long days of driving. Oh, I found um, the crane. You found the, well, in Russia, yeah. You want to pull it it's up? It's a video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, you met at the zoo. It's a long video, so you probably want to go through it a little bit, but it's was super that a impressive. Fiat Panda? Yes, yeah. Yeah, their their car broke down at a certain point, and they just ended up towing it the rest of the way to the. Dude, it is. Line. There's the other micro. No shit, around. it is tied to the seatbelts. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Look at them extend. Like yeah, <laughs> I know. I who knew seatbelts were that strong? It's so crazy. For the listener, they have the front, the driver, and the front passenger seatbelts out the front doors, still loop, still connected in the car, but then two giant metal hooks just pull it just straight up in the air. And it's yeah. nosing down exactly like you would expect a car to yep. do with an engine. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> You're yeah. just you slowly go. rolling it off the back. Fiat yeah. Panda 4x4. That's the answer. What is it? Fiat Panda 4x4. Oh, you we're looking at the answers, what you're saying, except that car is broken down. It's, yeah, except <laughs> one that's not being lifted via crane. There's got to be a four-wheel drive Japanese like uh, K car. Because aren't those those are limited to what eight hundred cc's? Eight something six hundred? No, I thought it was. Yeah, I don't know. We'll look into it and, and get back to you. 
I found the uh, the stat that I referenced in the last episode from that first season. So there were 400 teams who originally registered for the Mongol rally. Um, oh. And then uh, well, of the 400 who originally registered, 129 changed their mind or got cold feet and quit before even starting. And then... <laughs> And then of those remaining, uh, uh, another 23 had second thoughts and decided to drop out at some point in their journey, turn around and drive home. And hmm. then there were about 60 teams who broke down and were never able to make it all the way. So, Oh, they're from New Zealand. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, there were a bunch of, of Kiwis and Aussies. Yeah, some Korean girls, some people from all over. Yeah. For, for them, it's almost like if, if the Outback or the New Zealand mountains are your normal, like this can't be that different i guess like I guess. seriously yeah the, uh, just running around the middle of nowhere yeah. all right oh it i i will uh i don't on on our uh on the post i will link to this page to let people browse the images and videos yeah like it it's more than just what's on instagram like there's a ton of stuff here uh oh, before there. we close yep, yep. Chris, I just want to say that there is a 658cc turbo i3 available in the Suzuki Jimny. See? Like that's Suzuki Jimny. Yeah. Sorry to cut you off there, Scott. No. Well, not, the only issue with that is neither one of us can sleep in a Jimny. Well, you can sleep in a Jimny because you I'm and Robbie sleeping. are similar sized. You're normal sized. Anything. I'm not yeah. sleeping. In it. I'm, oh. I mean, Scott and his team use tents. I would be in a tent. Like, <laughs> <laughs> seriously <laughs> rooftop tent on me so sweet scott cool. is there anything you want to promote <laughs> yeah i mean just my podcast again is called far from home um so specifically about this whole journey to mongolia that was the whole first season of my podcast so we okay. go back all the way to the very beginning um and they could find far from home wherever they find their podcast or on my website uh sweet. far from home podcast.org or mm. i'm on social media uh instagram facebook wherever um definitely so, yeah awesome thank you so much for coming with us sure thanks for having me thanks for, thanks thanks for joining me living that for us yeah right <laughs> <laughs> educating us on the world in the process yeah. well, it's like I've, I've seen a number of things where people travel in mongolia but like not through all the stands not everybody went right. through <laughs> seriously yeah. like i said tajikistan in particular i highly recommend just beautiful scenery the mountains are incredible mm. and the Pamir highway is like if people like like off-road driving like it's an incredible road and very scenic and it's amazing i highly recommend it I, I own a chevy that might work for me in uzbekistan <laughs> if you break down yeah <laughs> yeah i don't think that's what it was thinking but I, it's got the same logo dude, southern russia had a that was an escalate on that road like the parts are in that part of the world somewhere like i mean that's it's a very big distance between those two places but <laughs> seriously that's funny well sweet uh i'll wrap cool. up the show real fast you can rate and review our show on itunes you can like and subscribe on youtube this might be an episode that is probably better to watch the youtube video for than to listen to just because of all of the different visuals and things that we talked about mm. um but i will in the <laughs> In the link, I'll 100% link to uh, Scott's page on his website that has all the images and the videos there. You guys can go browse. Um, you can follow Scott. Uh, it's at Far From Home Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. Twitter, he's Scott. How do you pronounce your last name? I didn't even clarify that. Gurian. It's just Gurian. my name, Scott Gurian, S-C-O-T-T-G-U-R-I-A-N. Uh, and he does uh, respond to direct messages, hence the fact that he's here on the show. <laughs> you guys want to, got more questions for Scott, hit him up. Uh, you I'm can follow. I Hunter. can't answer a lot of car questions. <laughs> no, no, I, I, it's probably more like uh, location and experience questions. Yes. There, not so much. I don't. I don't think anyone's going to question you on the the lower control arms for a Nissan Micro. Like, I don't okay. think that's good. No, <laughs> it's definitely what was shattered. By the way, it was a lower uh, control that's okay. arm. <laughs> that's not really our audience either. In all fairness. <laughs> So yeah, uh, you can follow Hooniverse, the Hooniverse on Twitter, the real Hooniverse on Instagram. You can read what we write on Hooniverse, UTV driver, ATV writer, and everyday driver. Yep. Eventually, I'll just have that memorized. So Ross is no, not like the one from Friends. I have that one memorized. And I'm at Overlanding Dad, and that's it. We've, we've done a show. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, Thanks Scott. <laughs> really, I really appreciate you coming on. That was awesome. Yeah, that was sure. really, no, really thank cool. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah.